One word to say to you. Look at me. <laughs> Sharing a stage with these very fine people and Jacinda Ardern, who is no doubt the woman of the moment and of the world. Um, uh, first of all, excuse me for reading, but I'm getting so forgetful. Tena kotu katoa. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm really honoured to be able to come and speak to you. Um, now, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because you know my name or you think you know my name, all right? So, you probably know me as Magda, maybe Magna Zabansky. It's actually pronounced Magda Shubansky. So, if you could just, after me, please, Magda Shubansky. <laughs> you know what, that was so much better than they do in Australia, let me tell you. Um, but you know my name, I don't know yours. So, on the count of three, could you please call out your name to me? One, two, three. Yeah, no, not too, this section here, not too great. This section, okay, one, two, three. Okay, no, it's not, it's not, it's this, it's actually this, these three people. If you could just, you three, could you please yell out, one, two, three. It's this gentleman here, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, one, two, three. I'm sorry. No, I heard you, I'm just sorry. Now. Stig, what I just did, was that humour or did I just totally other you as a, as a white male? I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a minefield, isn't it? It's a minefield. I'm, get, I'm getting out of comedy. It's just too hard. And I'm so wrong, you know. I just, that instinct I have as the court jester is to bite the hand that feeds me and if you tell me what to do, it is an impulse I cannot fight. I will do the opposite. I don't think I'm alone in that. I'm going to get much more serious here, though, because I want to talk about the power of inclusion. 12 minutes, 33. Um, and tell you a bit... I'm going to put my phone down for a sec, but I will go back to it. Um, and tell you why inclusion is so important to me. And a lot of it is actually to do with my name, Magda Szubański, because my father was Polish. Um, have any of you read my memoir? Available in all good bookstores, it's called Reckoning. Um, so, a lot of people know Poland now as the sort of prototypical Eastern European basket case, um, a repository of homophobia, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and a very right-wing country where they are trying to control the narrative of history. But what you don't know is that centuries ago, in the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, Poland was the New Zealand of its time. It was inclusive. They invited the Jews in and protected them. The Jews had a great deal of their own governance. It was actually known as the Jewish paradise. Uh, it was multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multicultural, a very tolerant society. In 1795, in fact, actually, it was the only country in Europe up until 1795 where homosexuality was not illegal. Can you imagine that? It's 1795. Until it was invaded and occupied by Austria, Russia and Prussia. They had a prototype of democracy, actually, in Poland. The king was elected. Um, it wasn't inherited. And it was a sort of known as the nobles' democracy. Roughly 15% of the population were considered noble. So that's a fair amount. For back then, that's a fair amount of people who were allowed to vote. Cut to the 20th century, and Poland is a country whose name is synonymous with death camps and anti-Semitism. So, a fact about my father, just to complicate this whole idea of inclusion and language and how we talk. My father used to refer to Jews as Yids. He would say, my God, he's a right bloody yid. Look at that nose, what a yid. My father's best friend was Vatsek Goldfarb, Jewish. In fact, my father had so many Jewish friends that he had, spoke, had like a working knowledge of Yiddish and was known as a Jew lover. At the age of 19, he was recruited to be part of, he was recruited to be an assassin in a top-secret counterintelligence unit 
working for the head of the HQ of the Polish underground. It sounds improbable, I swear to you, it's all there in the Polish archives. Um, and one of their jobs was to assassinate people who were telling the Nazis where Jews were hiding. My family hid Jews throughout the war. My grandmother, Jadwiga, looked like me. Fat, middle-aged, sort of upper-ish middle class, Polish matron, hid Jewish people all through the war at great risk to themselves. Poland was the only country where the instant penalty was death for hiding a Jew or helping them. And all, people think that the Nazi tyranny was uniform. It really wasn't. And they were different to different people. They treated the Danes very differently. The Danes also collaborated giving arms to the, the Germans. So whilst they're known as a righteous nation, they only had 7,000 Jews um, in Copenhagen. There were over 3 million Jews in, in Poland. And it has the largest number of righteous Gentiles. I always have a bit of a problem with the word righteous in any sense anyway, but yeah, we could go on about that in another talk. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, my grandmother slept with like a, a folded up Polish flag and a pistol in her pocket, a flag under her head and a pistol in her pocket because she was risking her life, not just of herself, but of her own children uh, and of any of their neighbours should they be caught. They would have been killed if they were lucky, much more likely tortured. Now, before we go into a whole trip about what heroes are like, having grown up around these people and met them, let me tell you, altruistic people can also be assholes. <laughs> they can be selfless and they can be selfish. We have such naive notions of what courage means, what being good means. Um, you look at my father, that contradiction, his language would be it's so unacceptable. And yet he would save, risk his life for Jewish people. But we do know that language is important. It's very important. And um, in fact, the recent studies show that um, actually of all, the only real feelings we have are four. Calm and arousal, pleasantness and unpleasantness. And everything else is a story that our mind concocts to explain the past and predict the future. So literally, we are the storytellers who are creating the matrix that we live in. So a lot of us here are storytellers and we think that we have the right to create that narrative. But that also really requires that you understand yourself uh, as well as you possibly can to know what levers and pulleys are directing you towards certain stories or making reinforcing certain beliefs for you. So I want to give some examples of people who've dropped the narrative and some examples of things that happened to me. Recently, um, I went to... Uh, so just to give you a background, right? When I was 19 at uni, radical lesbian feminist working in a women's refuge, you know, prototypical lefty. Um, until I realised that some of the people that subscribed to ideology weren't necessarily kind. You know, and from then on, I became very suspicious of ideology. When I went to Poland in 1982 and it was a communist country, again, that made me suspicious of ideology. Um, it's, it's interesting that this is in New Zealand because in 1934, the philosopher Karl Popper was here. And that's when he wrote his essay, um, The Open Society and Its Enemies. And in that, when he was dissecting fascism and where it comes from, he said, one of the most dangerous things in the world is a flawed idea. Similarly, ha Hannah Arendt, in her analysis of, um, of tyranny, um, said it was a failure of thinking. So, I have ended up, I think, um, in a lot of ways, not being able to just accept any of the ideologies, any of the articles of faith that have been handed to me. So recently, I was asked to go to Israel and Palestine on a, what's called a dual narrative trip. And it was to meet peacemakers on the ground. And it's an article of faith in the left that you're pro-Palestine and anti-Israel. And I thought, this is an incredible opportunity to meet people who are 
consciously dropping the narrative, dropping the invention, not saying that the things that happened to them didn't happen, but dropping the stories of what they tell themselves around all of that and meeting just person to person, heart to heart, soul to soul. And we met extraordinary people there. There was an Israeli man whose um, daughter was in the um, IDF. The, the, you know, she was 18. They're 18. They're kids in the army, you know. She was blown up by a terrorist. And he was talking along with, they always go in twos, it's called Parents Circle, um, uh, a Palestinian woman whose husband was shot by IDF soldiers. We met with um, a, a Palestinian terrorist who had spent 10 years in prison and in that time he taught himself Hebrew and English and he read Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King and he watched Schindler's List and particularly Schindler's List, that connection of suffering of the human experience enabled him to drop the story that he had about everything and start working, they're called combatants for peace, with the Israeli soldiers to try and find peace. That's the kind of inclusion, inclusion that I'm interested in, um, where we can actually really do what H Hannah Arendt told us to do, you know, think, and, and, and that laziness of thought and letting other people do the thinking for us is often the danger. There's a great quote, and no, no, now I do need my phone. So that, that genius, Marianne Evans, otherwise known as George Eliot, uh, the incredible writer, said, for there is no creature whose inward being is so strong that it is not greatly determined by what lies outside it. The ability to resist, you know, the matrix, to resist um, the comfortable thoughts that we all have about everything, is, is it's really hard to do that. And I had a couple of experiences of that recently. Um, a little while ago, I was in London and there was a cabbie there, ca London, classic London cab driver, and somehow or other, I don't know how, we got on to marriage equality and the fact that I was a you know prominent advocate for marriage equality. And he said to me, I don't mind the gays, but I do have a problem with the lesbians. <laughs> and I thought, oh, shit. I mean, for a double dose of homophobia and misogyny, great. <laughs> and I thought, no, just drop the story, Magda, or Magna, whatever your name is. Um, <laughs> and I said, oh, why is that? And he said, well, the gays are all right because they're keeping to themselves. But the lesbians, they're taking all the women. And so the conversation from that moment, because I hadn't gone, you're a homophobe, you're a misogynist, just went, started to go down this whole other path. <laughs> and then he started telling me, he said, because um, I haven't thought about this, and I've wondered if, you know, in a certain circumstance, if I could be gay. You know, like if, say, I don't know. I, was just, I said, what, like, say, if you're in prison? He said, yeah, that's it, if I was in prison. <laughs> And I said, oh, that's what we call a situational gay. And he said, oh, I like that. <laughs> I like that. And he, um, <laughs> he then went on to say how he had tried to have this conversation with a straight female friend of his. And she kept imposing on him saying, are you trying to tell me you're gay? And he's going, I'm not gay. I'm just wondering if I'm just shooting the shit, you know. Um, and... He was so, you know, he'd started by saying, oh, no, this is going to be a bit politi politically incorrect. And what he said sort of was, but then it turned out it totally wasn't. If I'd been put off by those words, and when I was advocating for marriage equality, if I'd found an enemy in every person who voted no or, or, or called everyone a homophobe, I would have had no allies. We would have had no allies and we would not have won the vote. And the importance of laying down your arms of not being so defensive that you find enemies where there are potential friends is a challenge to all of us, I think. And I had another very, very powerful example of that because I'm really, I'm very judgy. And um, <laughs> no, I have to work on a lot, years of therapy. Um, <laughs> my non-judgmental position has cost me a lot of money. Um, <laughs> 
Um, so I was at the airport and I saw a bunch of Greek patriarchs, priests, over in the corner. And immediately all the thoughts of patriarchy, you know, abuse in the church. But also because during the marriage equality survey, which was vicious in Australia, it was ungoverned, unregulated, the gloves were off, lies were told about LGBTQI people on national television. It was really horrible. And there were a couple of incidents that were particularly terrible within the Greek church. There were a couple of Greek priests who actually advocated shooting LGBTQI people. That's in my head. And I'm thinking, you fuckers, you know. <laughs> and then one of them comes over to me with this beautiful smile. And he puts out his hand and he says, I'm such a fan of your work. And I just went, oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm such an asshole. And then, and then he introduces me to the archbishop who's got the, like, the funny hat, you know. I didn't really know what to say, so I said, I like your hat. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then the first guy, as he was leaving, came up to me and he looked me right in the eye and he said, keep doing what you're doing. And I, the, that moment was exactly that, where we both dropped our narratives saw one another as human beings, flawed but trying, and that there was that potential for us to work together. Someone who I would have thought was the natural enemy, you know, and it was such a beautiful moment. And I'm here, I'm here because New Zealand is in this incredible place at the moment because of the leadership that Jacinda Ardern has shown in one of your, the darkest hours, and that's when you find out who you really are. You know, I grew up around Poles and Jews and, and let me tell you, the ones who are honest, they will say to you, you know, all this idea that we're good, they're bad, they're fearful, we're not, we're all frightened. You know, since se the Second World War, since 9-11, since the GFC, we are all frightened. Um, Martha Nussbaum, who's a fantastic moral philosopher from America, said that she'd, she'd realised that that sort of bifurcation, the polarisation... I'll, I'll go, I'll stop now. But she realised that it's based in fear. But she examined her own fear and realised that it was um, not, not um, that it was, that it was not rational and not based in reality. And so the duty is on all of us to examine our fear because we are, as she said, we are all part of the problem as well. So amazing what you're doing in this country in, the, in this moment of... of um, the way that New Zealand responded to that crisis showed leadership all around the world and was a bright hope. Um, but my word of warning is just think of Poland because um, <laughs> a few centuries ago, Poland was you. <laughs> um, and on that note, I, I'm going to go to the loo. So, bye-bye. Um, <laughs> <laughs>